I want to pull out an, a hymn out of the hymnal here. Anyone remember this song, The, the Church is One Foundation? Yeah. You remember that one? Two of you. Uh, <laughs> the church is one. I, I, uh, I labored over, well, should I try to sing one verse or I'll just read it to you? And I went with the, I'll just read it to you. <laughs> goes like this. The church, now listen closely. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Now I want to jump down to verse 3 and just read uh, part of verse 3 to you. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war. Now that's the truth. The church is at war with the world. We have a battle gone with the world all the time. You know, he's right on. He knows who the church is and what the church is doing here on this earth. But he also mentions here that there's not only battle from the outside, sometimes we have battles on the inside. And we have to overcome those also. <clears throat> so he's talking about, um, this was, by the way, this was John Wesley's father, Samuel, who wrote this song. Somebody else put it to, to music, but he, he wrote the words to this song. So he's, Samuel is talking about the inner turmoil that has always been a part of the church. For example, um, the church, I've heard that the church has, people in the church have disagreed on the kind of music they like. Anyone ever hear that happening in the church? Huh? <laughs> And, and I've also heard that if you go into the parking lot after church, that's when you really hear whether there's agreement or disagreement on what's going on inside in the church. <laughs> and I've heard there might even be some discussions in the church about the finances, especially when there's financial pressures on the church. What should we be paying for, huh, Marlene? And, and what, do, what can we let go? Where are we going to put our priorities? Sometimes there's even turmoil in the church over a pastor moving. And in our denom denomination, we can see major turmoil inside the church, the United Methodist Church, over the LGBTQ issue, which really isn't the issue, you know. The real issue is on the authority of Scripture. Because Scripture tells us clearly what God says uh, about marriage, doesn't He? Clearly. So the real issue is on the authority of Scripture. This is just the surfacing um, topic for uh, turmoil in the church right now. We're not perfect, are we, as the church? There are quarrels. There are hurt feelings sometimes. There's distress, and oftentimes there's weeping. I was standing in the church one day, and I heard down the hallway, down around the corner, a uh, discussion over a disagreement. And uh, it was obvious by the tone and the voices that there was disagreement. <clears throat> I didn't hear what the topic was, but... I did hear one person finally settle the argument by saying, you do it your way, and I'll do it God's way. And that's the way we sometimes look at it in the church. I've got what God has to say. Uh, the Holy Spirit's talked to me, and so you do it your way. <laughs> it happens. We're not perfect. Now the thing is, my question is, why does the Lord allow this to go on in the church? 
Fights, fighting within, turmoil within. Why does he allow it? And then when you think about God being over the church, and you try to figure out why he allows this or that or does this or that, then usually we get way beyond our capabilities, don't we? Because his understanding, his ways, his wisdom is so much higher than ours that we don't know how he uses all of that, using our weaknesses so far above us. Let's stop and pray. Father, what a pleasure it is to be here today. The church in the church. To be with brothers and sisters who also love you and have given their lives to you. Who count on you. Who praise you and worship you. The church, Lord so crucial and so important to us. We thank you for your church. Today, Lord, would you remind us again how important the church is and some of the ministry, ministries and priorities that you give to the church? Speak to us, Lord. And anoint this teacher in Jesus' name. And the believers said, Amen. Amen. I want to park in one place this morning in the, in the book of Isaiah, the last chapter of Isaiah, chapter 66. This chapter, if you were to, if you were to sit down and read this chapter later on today, Without much instruction, you, you might think that, well, these first two verses are on one topic, and then he changes topics, and he, he dwells on something else in these next three verses, and then he changes topics again and starts on something else in these next few verses, when the truth is there's a sequence to what God is laying out here. So... I invite you to try to see the sequence of what God is saying here so you can lay it out and get the, and get the, um, and get the message that God's trying to give us out of this. So he starts out, verse 1, This is what the Lord says, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Okay, what's, what's he What's he referring to here now? How big he is. Could you build me a temple as good as that? Could you build me such a resting place? Now, he's not saying here, you shouldn't have built the temple. Don't build another temple. He's not saying that. The trouble is, the people were building, they built a temple for God, and they thought God would be happy with them because they built a temple for him. And that he could rest inside that temple that they built for him. And he's telling them, you think that temple is going to satisfy me? He says, I made everything. The earth is my footstool. And he goes on to say in verse 2, my hands have made both heaven and earth. They and everything in them are mine. So, he's telling the people then who thought they made him happy, they made, a, they made a temple for him, he could be happy in that temple. He's saying, nope, it's going to take more than that. We can't just build a building and say, here you are, God, be happy in this, and then leave him alone. We can't build walls around God. You can't put God in a box. That's what we do if we just see him put in a place with four walls around it. We can't put him in a box and then pull him out once in a while whenever we want him. I'll give you an example. Let's look at our own place right here. We have 
a real nice facility. The trustees take care of this place real well. God's blessed us uh, with finances here the last few years that, have, that has allowed them to work on everything that they wanted to work on. <clears throat> and they've done a good job, and we thank them for that. And we have a beautiful sanctuary. You know, this is a gorgeous sanctuary. This is a great place to worship. I brought another fella in here uh, about a week ago, and I said, this is a great place to preach and to teach right here. The people are so wide open. They let you in that, and the, uh, the, you can feel the presence of God here. It's just a, this is a nice place. It's a good facility. <clears throat> well, we have a nice building. And then, then we say, we tell God we're, we're going to set aside an hour and 30 minutes uh, for each of the two services that we have here this week. And then uh, Tammy puts a sort of an order of worship together, depending on if, whether there's anything special going on or not. And then, then uh, I go through the scriptures and I'm looking for uh, a topic, a message that's, that's timely. And then we come and gather. We set, set uh, other things aside and, we, and we, we come here and then we tell God, meet us right here, God. This is where we want you to show yourself today. And then when the worship's all over, sometimes we jump back to our life routines and to our own goals and carry on like we did before. We tell God sometimes, I'll serve you here and I'll serve you here, but don't ask me to do any more than this. Besides, so-and-so ought to be doing that. They're not doing very much. And they'd be better at it anyway. See, we can't say to God, I need you today, and then live the next day however we want to. As if it didn't really matter. We can't draw the lines we can't put God in a box and then call on Him when we need Him or we want Him. We don't want to put God in a box like He felt the Hebrew people were doing. He is supposed to be our Lord and Master. That means as a Master, whatever He says is what we want to do. Somebody say amen. amen. See, if, if we don't let him be our master and we only call upon him when we need him, then we're, then we're headed for trouble. And essentially what we're doing then is using God instead of allowing him to use God us. You hear me, church? Now, that's a good phrase. That's a good principle uh, to hang on to today. There are those, and then we sometimes fall into this, of where we want to use God instead of having Him use us. One of the uh, churches in our community has a ministry built around this principle that says it's all about people. Well, yeah, if you're taught to use God and call upon Him whenever you need Him, whenever you want Him, then yeah, you might think it's all about people. But if you're going to give yourself to God and let Him use you and let Him be the master, then it's all about God, isn't it, church? And it is all about God. So if we're just using God instead of Him using us, then that means trouble for us. But not just trouble for us, it means that there will be trouble in our church. For, back to verse 2 again, 66-2, uh, the rest of that verse. God said, I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts. I will bless those who 
tremble at my word. Now remember that phrase, tremble at my word. See, here's an attitude being shown here that God, God is talking about here, that where men are placing God over them as their master, see. Those who are humble and have contrite hearts. God is saying, I'm not going to be resting inside some building you put there for me, a temple or, or a church building. I want to live inside people who have contrite and humble hearts, which are people who tremble at my word. And that's what's happening in this new covenant we're under. Amen? Now he's not dwelling in buildings. He's dwelling in us, isn't he? That's his plan. That's what he desires. But he only dwells in those who have humble and contrite hearts. Those who tremble at his word. Now how would you describe someone who trembles? That's quite a word, isn't it? trembles at the Word of God. How would you describe that to a friend? Now I would say someone who trembles at His Word is someone who cares about what God wants. It is someone who honors the Word of God. And if they honor the Word of God, then they're searching the Word of God. And usually when they're searching the Word of God, they're meditating upon the Word of God. I was laying on my bed meditating here a week or so ago. Becky comes in and says, you still in bed? <laughs> I says, Becky, I'm meditating. <laughs> and I really was meditating. <laughs> I had to convince her though. She <laughs> Those who tremble at His Word are also those who follow His Word. Don't you think? Church? Those who tremble at His Word, search it. Let me ask you, do you know the Ten Commandments? If you tremble at His Word, you're searching it, you want to know what He wants, then some of us got to be getting in here and here, right? And it seems like there's a few places that are more appropriate to learn and to memorize, to know, than others, like the Ten Commandments, wouldn't you think? So do you know the Ten Commandments? Put no other gods before me, right? Uh, don't build any statues and worship them, even of me. Don't take my name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. It's different from every other day. Prove it in your life. Honor your mother and father. Don't murder anyone. Don't, what comes next? Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. And don't covet what your neighbor has. Okay? You tremble at his word, then you got to know it. Right? Now, I would say if you got seven out of ten, you get a passing grade. Right? <laughs> Only thing is, I'm not the teacher. <laughs> Somebody else is at the head. His name's Jesus. See, those who don't tremble at His Word, don't give His Word much place in their lives. I am so grateful that uh, I'm in a church that honors the Word of God. And it was displayed on a Bible Sunday. You know, every year Bible Sunday, I like to challenge you to be in His Word every day, right? And we have a tremendous percentage of people who told God that they would be in His Word every day, and a high percentage of those of you said you were going to read through the whole Bible in this coming year. Wow! Those are people who tremble at His Word. Hallelujah! <clears throat> 
Now, the opposite of that would be those who are boxing God in, pulling him up whenever they want him. The, the, the ultimate description of someone boxing God is a hypocrite. And those who don't tremble on his word will breed two things in their lives. Let me give you these two things. First, they will have spiritual blindness. They won't be able to see things as they actually are. It says now, that's what God's leading up to next. He, he's talking to these Jews who, who thought they were just fine with God, but actually they were spiritually blind because they weren't trembling at His word. And so He said to them in verse 3, But those who choose their own ways, delighting in their detestable sins, will not have their offerings accepted. When such people sacrifice a bull, and they did, didn't they, in those days? That was part of their religious system. When, when such people sacrifice a bull, it is no more acceptable than a human sacrifice. When they sacrifice a lamb, it's as though they had sacrificed a dog. And when they bring an offering of grain, they might as well offer the blood of a pig. And when they burn frankincense, now that sounds pretty religious, doesn't it? All these sacrifices and burning frank frankincense, it sounds like they're good religious people, doesn't it? But if they don't tremble at His Word, if they're just using God, He said, it's as if they had blessed an idol. Now, people who tremble at His Word and do these same things, religiously, they please God. But those who don't tremble at His Word and do these religious things, He said, those offerings from them are detestable to Him. Not that He just doesn't receive them, they're detestable to Him. Oh my, I better listen. <clears throat> Now, if we were to look at being religious today in our worship, we would think that a good way to worship and to please God would be to come and sing, right? We sing unto Him. Amen. And we pray, don't we? Not only pray when we're together, but, but we pray on our own too. And we give a little money, right, unto the Lord. And we may even serve on a committee somewhere, being good religious people. Might even go on the mission trip with Lotus. Then we'd really be religious, wouldn't we? <clears throat> but if we're just using God instead of allowing Him to use us, we're spiritually blind and we're only look, we only seem to be wise in our own eyes. Hmm thinking God is pleased with all this stuff we're doing, all these religious things. When we, if we're just using Him, He detests them, He says. And the result of doing these religious things and not trembling at His word, He mentions in verse 4, I will send them great trouble. I will, not I might, Send them great trouble. People have troubles in the church, and sometimes they don't realize what's going on because they're spiritually blind. And what's the trouble he's going to send? One of the troubles is all the things they feared. There's not, there's not a worse judgment on anyone than bringing upon them the very things they fear. You can't think of a tougher judgment than that. Hmm. And then he says, For when I called, they did not answer. When I spoke, they did not listen. See, they didn't, well, they deliberately sinned before my very eyes and chose to do what they know I despise. They didn't tremble at his word. So he sent them turmoil. 
and, they re and the fears, they realized their fears. And they had no peace in their thought life, no peace in their heart, and lost peace in many relationships around them. Now that's one of the results of just using God. The other result, he says, is these people who use me, or try to use me, they, are in, they become intolerant of other people. And he mentions this in verse 5. Hear this message from Yahweh, all you who tremble at His words. Your own people, those who don't tremble, hate you and throw you out for being loyal to my name. The Lord, let the Lord be honored, they scoff. Be joyful in him, but they will be put to shame. These are the ones who reject those who do not agree with them. It's my way or no way. This is a result of using God, not trembling at his word. And in the larger body, of the church. This leads to splits in churches and leads to splits in denominations. You know there are 80 different Methodist denominations in the world, soon to be 81. And I'm going to be in on the new one. I believe it's God's will. But what brought about the split? Those who were not trembling at His word. His word clearly says. And they said, nope, I feel differently because the world is telling us. Hmm. And this intolerance uh, shows up in the local body of the church, inside the, the individual churches, as these people uh, will, who will be rejecting others in the church who are standing on the Word, they're rejecting them, and here's some of the reasons, uh, for their stands against sexual immorality, their stands against abortion, their stands against tattoos, their stands against cohabitation, their stands against gambling, their stands against Halloween, their stands against homosexuality, their stands against the love of money. And they say to these people making these stands, you don't agree with how I see the Bible truth. God is against those who bring trouble into the body of Christ. Now I could stop right here and I could tell you many stories about how God has removed troublemakers from the church. And they're ugly stories. Sometimes God used people, but I've seen most of the time the church people themselves wouldn't do anything about troublemakers, but God removed them. <clears throat> oh my. Now church, still, with all these imperfections that we have. Still, Jesus continues to use His church. He does. Hallelujah! And that is called grace. Thank you, Jesus. Now, the sequence, He carries the sequence to the next step. And He gives a prophecy about what he's going to do and, 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 and the good things that he's going to bring to pass, uh, verses 7 through 9. Now listen, here's what he wants to do. He's just talking about the troubles, right? But now he's prophesying some good stuff that he's going to do. It says, Before the birth pains even begin, Jerusalem gives birth to a son. Now he's prophesying. Now, how many have had birth pains in here? Could you, wouldn't that be spiffy if you delivered before the birth pain started? 
Now that would be fast, wouldn't it? Now that's his point right here. He's going to be doing something so fast that they, that, that they won't believe it. Who has ever seen anything as strange as this? Who ever heard of such a thing? Has a nation ever been born in a single day? Has a country ever come forth in a mere moment? But the time of Jerusalem's, in most translations it used the word Zion right here. But by the time Zion's birth pains begin, her children will already be born. That's fast. Would I ever bring this nation to the point of birth that he's talking about, that he's going to do, and then not deliver it? Ask the Lord. No, I would never keep this nation from being born, says your, says your God. <clears throat> now, this is a prophecy. Now, we know he's speaking to the Jews right here, so there's a prophecy to the Jews in this. Back in verse 8, he said, Has a nation ever been born in a single day? Has there been? How about May 14th, 1948? Hmm? Wasn't there a, a nation born that day? And, and what's, the, what's the name of that nation? Amen. He did it in a day. This was a prophecy speaking forward to what God was going to do. Hallelujah. But this is also a parallel prophecy. What he speaks of right here is what he also is going to bring to pass in some other groups of people. The word nation right here is also translated to the word people. So, this is also a prophecy of Christ coming again, when very quickly he sets up his kingdom on this earth, this kingdom of God, Jesus ruling over the whole earth. And he does that very quickly. It will happen very quickly. But this is also a prophecy uh, that was pointing ahead to the church. Now the church was born in a day. And what day was that? Help me out. Pentecost, right? The Holy Spirit came down from God and came and indwelt those who were following Jesus and listened to Jesus. And in one day, the church was born. Now, the church from that point on became a foreshadow of what the kingdom of God would be when it came in its fullness, when God brought it in its fullness upon the earth. People look at us, how we love each other, we treat each other, uh, what happens in our relationships, in the church, our focuses, our, in life, our priorities, our language, our music. People watch us, and they should see a foreshadow of the kingdom of God, of what this earth is going to be like completely one of these days. A foreshadow. That's what we are right now. We're in the midst of a, of a wicked, dark earth right here, and world right here. And yet we shine as, a, as, a, as, as the kingdom of God. <clears throat> now, I want to focus on, uh, on this prophecy as God is using it to, uh, to talk about the church and what He's doing and will do in the church. Because it's through the church that God is producing His children right now. It's through the church. Now, often that is painful, the childbirth, producing more children for God. Yet, He's going to continue to reproduce children in the church. And by this, He is forming a nation he keeps producing more children in the church for himself. And this nation of his, he's forming a nation, and it's growing larger. And it's called the kingdom of God. He's forming the kingdom of God. And this nation will finally be established in the twinkling of an eye. When Jesus returns and he takes his church out of here, we're going to know who's for real and who's not, won't we? 
We're going to know who's a citizen of the kingdom of God and who is not, won't we? And the nation will be born. And, and just like that. It will be known just like that. Now, now he's, in the, he, he's still following a sequence here. So he's talking about uh, what he's, what he's going to do and how quickly he's going to do it. And then these next verses, he talks about the rejoicing. It's like a family rejoicing uh, once he brings these things to pass. Now listen to what he says. Rejoice with Jerusalem. Now we might just substitute the word church right there. Although the church does not take the place of Israel, we know that. But this is a parallel prophecy that applies to the church. Rejoice with the church. Be glad with her, all you who love her, all, and all you who mourn for her. Now that's touching some hearts right now, just God saying that. We rejoice with the church, don't we? Some of you, we've been pouring our hearts out to Him today with others who are part of the church. And we're glad for the church, aren't we, aren't we brothers and sisters? Oh, what an idea. What a creation God had in coming up with this church. And all you who love her. I don't know about you, but one of my earliest memories is VBS, sitting on a little chair about yay high <clears throat> underneath a stained glass window in New Athens, Ohio. Uh, the, the church is like a mother to me. How about you? Verse 11, drink deeply of her glory. Come here and drink. Partake of what the church has to give. Take it in. Even as an infant drinks at its mother's comforting breasts. This is what the Lord says. I will give the church a river of peace and prosperity. The wealth of the nations will flow to her. The economy doesn't mean a thing to God. He will take care of His church, the church that trembles at His word. Her children will be nursed at her breasts. Now isn't that what takes place in the church? Jake's got some kids here. They're nurturing already, aren't they, Jake? Amen. Tyler's got a new one. Going to be coming to the church and, and getting fed, huh? Getting nourished and growing up and maturing in the church. Carried in the arms of the church and held in her lap. I will comfort you there in the church. See this promise? I will comfort you there in the church. As a mother comforts her child. How many times has the Lord comforted you right here? Amen? Amen. Oh, bless you, Lord. Bless you for your church. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Today, God and the church is producing children. God produces, raises, and comforts His children through the church. Now, the actual source of the comfort is God Himself, but through the church church. I remember Alan and Marie Byler. They came out of the Amish church. They saw that salvation was by grace and grace alone. They didn't have to follow any laws to earn their way into heaven. But their family rejected them. Both their families totally rejected them. So when they would go to a funeral, they were not allowed to sit with their family. They had to sit in an outside room. But Alan and Marie found comfort and encouragement and all they needed to carry on in the church. The church was crucial to them. Isn't that right, Beck? And then there was Sue. Uh, Sue had uh, two little girls, uh, one to one father and one to another father, a different father, and she never got married. And she was an outcast. And she had lived with her granddad. But Jesus saved her. And she came to the church. And in the church she was accepted. She was loved. 
Through the church she got a job. Through the church she got a car. Remember getting, praying for that car. In the church she grew in wisdom and became one of the best at handling the Word of God that, that we knew at that time. The church God used to comfort and care for Sue and her girls. Then it was Vic. I remember Vic. Still calls me up once in a while from his truck. Forty-some years old. Finally got saved. He's got his second family started with another woman. But he got saved. And he was with us in the church for a couple of years. And one day we were doing something together and he broke down. Vic was one, he was a big, strong, powerful guy. It's one reason why he never had friends in school. He scared the bejeebies out of them and would whoop up on them if they messed with him. That's all he knew how to do because that's how he got raised by his dad. And, but Jesus put him in the church. And, and one day he said to me, he said, I never had a friend ever till I came to this church. Hmm. And then you, how about you? Has God comforted you, fed you, nourished you in his church? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> now, comforted in the church involves two things. Because in the church, we get some direct fellowship with God, don't we? right here. And that's part of the comfort. Knowing God's presence right here. Not that we don't out there, but boy, we do in the church, don't we? And, and the other part of that comforting here comes through full involvement in the church. Not just on the outside and showing up once in a while, but becoming very familiar with the facility and with who hangs out here all the time. And, and uh, taking part in the movie coming up and serving on some committee and just hanging out and going on a bike ride or just the many things we have going on. That is part of the comforting, isn't it, church? When you join in with all of that, the life of the church. And he, let me close with this. And he says, when you see these things, your heart will rejoice. Now, you've seen that, what God does for you and yours in the church and others in the church, haven't you? Does that cause you to rejoice? You will flourish like grass. Do you believe that? Have you experienced that? Everyone will see the Lord's hand of blessing on his servants. Those who tremble at his word not just users of God, but allows God to use them. Others will see his hand of blessing on them. And when you see this, accept it, how important the church is. Order your life around the church, not the church around your life. Set your priorities according to Jesus and what he's doing in the church. Is there anything more important? Depend on the church, even with its mistakes, even with its weaknesses. And God's hand will be obvious in your life and bring rejoicing to you. Now bow your heads with me a moment, would you please? Maybe you've never made a commitment to the church, the church that belongs to Jesus. Maybe you never have. It's just sort of there. Today, would you tell, would you tell Jesus that you're going to make his church a priority in your life because you see his purpose in using it to win souls and grow the kingdom? and to comfort his children. Would you commit to his church today? Just whisper. 
whisper under him where your heart wants to go in the church. And I know some of you have made that commitment before, but maybe you've allowed other things to rise up and gain higher priority in your life. And you want to recommit yourself to the church that belongs to Jesus. Recommit today so that you will receive the promise of rejoicing in God and what he does in his church. In Jesus' name, let this be so, Lord. And the church said, Amen. Love Joy, would you come forward? Love Joy is going to have a biopsy later, coming up pretty soon here.